we're going to wait here a few minutes and allow people some time to get on and have Facebook push this out, then I'll start. There's two. <clears throat> Morning, Frank. You're always my first faithful attender. <clears throat> you need some water? No, I'm all right. All right, we got five people on here, so we'll start. So thank you for uh, being here today and for those who will tune in later on and watch this on Facebook or YouTube. I'll get it uploaded tonight. Uh, we appreciate you being here. Uh, I uh, missed last week. I needed a little rest, so I took that Sunday off. So I'm glad to be back. Hi, Cecil. Good to see you on here. Uh, I've, I was thinking all week long on what I was going to start with because I, in, I finished the previous topic and uh, my wife had asked me to teach the parables. So I kind of looked at them a little bit and I thought that'd be a good thing to do. And uh, I didn't realize how many there were of Jesus as I knew there were a lot, but there's actually 46 parables. And uh, of course in the Old Testament, there's all kinds of parables in there. But so what we're going to do is we're going to look at these parables and seek to find a more spiritual understanding instead of a physical understanding. You know, most of us all of our life reading the Bible. Hi, Carol. Uh, reading the Bible is more from a physical understanding how it applies to the outward man. But what we want to learn is how things apply spiritually to us. And because we are spirit, we are holy breath. Good morning, Ann. And we want to, we are learning how to live out of who we are. And that's one of the most important things in the world, uh, in my opinion. I remember years ago, Judy Vandenberg wrote a book called Living Out of Who I Am. And uh, the problem is, even back then, we didn't fully know who we were, you know, but we are now and we are understanding our union with Father. So these parables are very important. Uh, the reason Jesus spoke in parables is basically because people uh, were not. Uh, in a, in a state of being where they could understand spiritual teachings like Jesus sought to teach. He was there to raise their awareness, <clears throat> and, and uh, his teachings today are to help us raise our awareness. He wasn't there to heal people and, and do all this stuff that we've seen him to do that people love him for. Uh, he, he was there to heal him of their disease, which was their, their mistaken identity, and that would have solved all the other problems. And so that's the journey that we're on today. So we want to glean the true meanings behind this. And I'm going to use a chronological order. So it's not going to necessarily, they're going to be in one after the other through, through the, the gospels, but it's going to be a chronological order. Basically I'm going to use Matthew uh, and this and some of the other books, but mainly Matthew. So the remainder of this book, which is going to be uh, chapter three or, or book three, excuse me, volume three, and then probably several, another whole volume, of a book will really contain these 64 parables and I'm excited to be able to go through these. The first one we're going to start with is in Matthew uh, 13, uh, 10 through 17. Uh, in the midst of his parables of the kingdom, Jesus explains something of the purpose of these parables to his disciples. And the answer is kind of tricky to some people because it goes against common assumption that the purpose of parables was to simplify and clarify. You know, but basically these were, these had uh, tremendous spiritual truths. And that's why I've been studying this series for, or titled this series for a long time, The Spiritual Code and Symbology of the Living Word. Because we, sometimes we need the code. You know, when somebody invites me to their home sometime, there's a gate and you can't get in that gate without a code, right? You know, so usually it's a four digit code or whatever, and it gets you in. And Jesus talked about the kingdom of heaven and he told Peter that the gates and of course, the King James Version says the gates of hell, but it says the gates of this knowledge will not prevail against the church. And so there are some gates uh, that religiosity has put up, you know, that basically we're not allowed to enter, but we're learning the, the code to get in. And uh, it's important for us to do that. So the disciples came and they said to him, why do you speak to them in parables? And Jesus entered them in this way again that some people might find disturbing. But he said, to you, it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. 
And again, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, heaven, all that is us. It's inside of us. It's an, it's an awareness. If you're going to live out of the kingdom of heaven or the cool of the day, then there is an awareness that you've got to come to. Just like I say all the time, if you're going to go to the ocean, there are some keys to be able to live in the ocean and you have to know what they are. You have to know how to mix oxygen and nitrogen and all that. If you're going to go out in outer space, there's some keys and there's some understandings that you have to have. So to, to live out of the kingdom of God, which is knowing you're righteous, then the perfection and peace and joy that provides you, you've got to understand some things. And so he said, for the, to the one who who's, uh, has much, more will be given. And uh, that actually means handles is what that means. It's not necessary that you have a lot but you're able to handle what you have. Just like the Word of God, most people can't handle the truth of the Word of God and are not able to function out of it. So if you're handling what you have, then you're gonna receive more understanding because it's ever unfolding. Then he said for to the one who, uh, uh, who, again, the one that has will be given much more in abundance and the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And so that's not really, Father, taking it away from you, but if you don't handle what you have, then it's like you don't have it at all. So it's lessons, if you would. Then he said, this is why I speak to them in parables, because seeing they don't see, and hearing they don't hear, nor do they understand. Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, you will indeed hear, but you never understand. You will indeed see, but you never perceive. For this people, is, this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears, they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn. And I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, he's talking to the disciples, they see, and your ears, for they hear. For truly I say to you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. Now, of course, according to the King James Version of the Bible, it looks like the disciples didn't hear very much and didn't understand, and they struggled in the beginning. But I believe as time went on, the disciples learned more and more and more and had greater understanding. And I also know without a doubt that after Jesus ascended, resurrected, if you would, came back out of that state of death, Jesus taught them even more. And they began to minister in a more powerful way because they were ministering out of who they are. So this kind of goes back to what I taught a few chapters back in my book here is it's one thing to hear something, but it's another thing to listen. So yes, they walked amongst Jesus and they heard him talk, but they didn't listen. They didn't pay attention. So all they heard was noise, if you would, and they didn't understand. And I always say, what good is it to listen to a teacher if you don't understand what they're saying? You know, you can say I attend every class there was. But you, it's important to really listen intently to learn what's been said. So the kingdom of heaven always symbolizes a state of consciousness in which our entire being is in divine harmony with our Father, with the divine mind. That's really what the kingdom of heaven represents. It's a state of consciousness. It's knowing who you are. It's knowing that you're right, not because of something you've done or that what's been done to you or what's been done for you. You're right because that's how you were created from the foundation of the world. Jeremiah says, we came into this world upright and we never left that position, but we never, we most part did not have that understanding. So teachers of spiritual truth and spiritual truth is what I call the living word. There's the written word and then there's the living word. The living word is what brings life to us. And so teachers of the living word of truth find their most difficult work is getting students to recognize that heaven is a condition of awareness. And Jesus, I'm sure, experienced that himself. And there was a lot of difficulty in him explaining things. So that's why he had all these numerous parables and comparisons that they should have understood that helps them understand the kingdom. Uh, the Jews particularly, their early writings were filled with all kinds of parables. And they, they, were, I, they were used to hearing parables. And so Jesus used that to help them. So these were all illustrative of some condition pertaining to kingdom living. And not one time did he describe it to be a place located in a distant realm. Never. So he was always talking about heaven as being a, a state of consciousness. 
you know, where you live out of the heavenly, where the Bible says we're seated in the heavenly. It doesn't say heavenly places. They added the word places where, where we're seated, and the word seated means at rest. A gentleman wrote me the other day and wanted to know what rest really meant. But rest means comfortable with. You know, a lot of people aren't comfortable uh, realizing that they are in the presence of Father. They're not comfortable approaching Father. They're more comfortable approaching Jesus. And because of that, they're missing out on what Jesus came for, which was to restore man back to their contact with Father. And so we want to enter into that rest. And the Bible says in Hebrews, surely there will be a people that will enter into my rest. And that means be comfortable with me. I've been around people that I really enjoy, but for some reason or another, particularly in the work field, they, 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 because of my position, they may have put me up higher than they should have. And so they were always not real comfortable being around me, not comfortable opening up and talking to me. They didn't see themselves as an equal. And that's what the problem is with our father. We've never seen ourselves as an equal. And so we have been reluctant to approach our father and converse with our prophet. We're all, usually made to feel ashamed. And, but, but John said, let this same mind be in you that was in Jesus. He considered not robbery to be equal with God. So he was at rest with his father, right? And then he became a servant to all people. So in spite of these often repeated stories by Jesus showing the kingdom of heaven to be this state of consciousness, the mass amount of basically the Western evangelical Christianity today teaches this, uh, these as real places. They teach them as real stories. The, I, I, I can't even begin to tell you about people that would always talk, uh, ask me about the, the rich man and the poor man, Lazarus and the rich man. And, and one of them went to hell and one of them was crying out for water, or Lazarus. And they think that's real. And they would swear up and down, it's a real story. And I'd say, look at it. It's, it's a parable. It's not real. You know, and so it's, they don't understand that. And then when they teach the kingdom of God, the Western evangelical Christianity always teaches that as a place that we're going to go someday to heaven. You know, because I ask, I have people uh, write me all the time and call me and say, well, what does this mean when no drunkard will enter into the kingdom of heaven and all that stuff? And they don't understand that that's awareness. It's not going to heaven someday. So if such a place existed, Jesus certainly would have talked about it more. And that's our hope is to go there some, where our hope is to rise up into this spiritual awareness and this oneness consciousness with our Father. That's what we desire in our life. So in Matthew 13, 31 through 33, and Matthew 13, 44, 15, I'm, I'm not, this is not part of the parables, but I want to share just a little bit about five short stories that illustrates six different problems concerning this condition or our relationship to it. And applying these spiritual laws, if you would, in mind, and we know them, we find that Jesus was talking about a universal truth and its expression. And so the first one is the mustard seed comparison. I'm not going to read it, but I'm just going to tell you what it's about a little bit. The mustard seed comparison is to show the capacity of this apparently small thought of truth, the small thought of truth to... Uh, to develop in an individual to the point that it brings us to a higher thought, which is what the birds of the air would represent. So in other words, it doesn't take a whole lot of truth if you receive it, that there's a capacity within us for that to enlarge and enlarge and enlarge and bring us to this abiding place of higher thoughts. A little bit of truth can destroy a whole lot of untruth if it's received and it's, it's, it's allowed to function in a person's life. So this mustard seed is a little bitty thing, which you plant it and it grows into a really large plant, just like an oak tree. I'm always amazed how you can put a little bitty seed, a little acorn in the ground and water it and it gets the nutrients and it can grow into a hundred year old oak tree. And that's a little bit of faith mixed with a willingness to hear the truth can change a person's life. And your faith is the faith of Father, right? We put all of our faith in the faith of Father. So it's not about me not having enough faith. It's just where I put my faith. And then the leaven story, the leaven is the truth. And the woman in this story is the soul. And that's who we are. We are a living soul. So when a word of truth <clears throat> is apparently hidden in the inner consciousness, it's not idle. It's still there. Don and I was talking about a word mystery. Uh, one of our friends named their, their daughter mystery. And mystery is mysterion, mysterion. 
and it literally represents a truth that's hidden by uh, 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 religious rites. So the more and more we get involved in religious rites and, and orthodoxy and the way they do things, then that hides the truth. But if you hear some truth, then what it does, it quietly spreads through your whole consciousness until you literally become enlightened. You dwell on it, you meditate on it, you mutter it or whatever, and you allow that truth to come in because Jesus said the truth will make you free and the truth is like a great explosion. To me, it's like there's darkness in my room. I come in the middle of the night and there's no light whatsoever and I turn the truth on, which is light, and it explodes instantly and fills the whole room. And so when we allow just a little bit of truth, it's powerful. And that's why I tell people just, you know, start a little bit at the time. You don't have to have the whole enchilada yet. You know, you don't have to know everything. But whatever it is that you're going to know, it must be truth. And then truth works in your consciousness until you really wake up. And it enlightens you. So people who have for years uh, had this hidden by religiosity. And the biggest thing was that we had contact with Father God. When it talks about Christ in you, it's contact with Father God in me. What's in me? The divine mind of God. My union with God. So this living word of truth that work in you it's, 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 it can be so quick that it's, uh, it releases a large exposition of the living word inside of you and it recognizes that you're ripe and ready for the truth. And so that's why I like, uh, I like to find people who are not really indoctrinated in religiosity and they're hungry and they want truth. And when they're that kind of, when, when they're that way, when you give them the truth, they're ripe, they're ready for it, they receive it and it changes them instantly. And so that's a great thing. Then the next one is the treasure hid in the field. It's a logical truth that all that is belongs to sons and daughters of God. Everything that is, everything that Father ever created and imaged out, it belongs to us right now. It's hidden inside of a field though. And again, what hid it? Religiosity, uh, religious rites and all that hid it. And so they can be brought forth by one who gives up this outer and looks for the real value. And I, I, I love that there because I, I love where Job said, my help cometh from within. Most of my life, I'm 70 years old, I would say half of my life or close to it, I always looked to without. I was always looking to a father up there. I was lifting my hands looking up right, in a sense that father is up there. I would pray and bow my head because I felt like I couldn't come into the presence of father. We were taught to bow our head. There's all kinds of things that, that hindered us to, to where we can really realize that we need to quit looking without and look within because within is the very source of all creation and that's our father. That's where there's real value. Getting something from without, that's not real value. I mean, uh, winning a lottery, you know, uh, getting the perfect job or whatever, that's not real value that's going to sustain you. When you go within, then you find your true supply and it never runs out whatsoever. <clears throat> then there's another one. The merchant is one who's seeking for a jewel if you would, of the soul, or our spiritual good, the merchant seeking for spiritual good, and through a correction of thought, a discussion, and sometimes argument and debating whatever, but he also must give up all that so-called value uh, to embrace the without mixture living word. So sometimes we're seeking for things that we want, and literally it's a carnal desire. But what we must seek for is the, the living word without mixture. Because the mixture is, you know, God loves you, but God loves the whole world, but, you know, and Jesus did this, but you have to do that. And that's the mixture that doesn't belong there. So that's just a real simple thing about that. And then the net cast into the sea, that's a state of mind that seeks truth in many places. And it gets much that has been thrown away and hidden by religious rights. That's kind of where I'm at right now. You know, the, uh, the biggest part of my life, I was taught to stay away from spiritual understanding, to stay away from symbology, all that stuff. My uncle told me that. I've had other ministers say, you shouldn't delve in that because it's really bad or whatever. And so that was hid by religiosity. So they threw those, in a sense, they threw them away. But when I learned to cast my net in other places, and, and other teachings that normally the church wouldn't let you read, then all of a sudden I find some things that have been thrown away by religiosity. And that's our union with Father, our oneness with Father. There's a huge list that we could talk about that we've discovered. 
And the greatest one uh, to me is that the Bible is about awareness. It's not about you doing something to please Father. It's just we need to raise our awareness to who we are and who our Father is. And then the last one is the end of the world. This is the point in consciousness where the true thoughts are in the majority and the error thoughts are losing their hold. The true thoughts. Paul said, if there's anything worth thinking on, think on these things. The word things can represent logos. It can re represent the living word. It represents the truth. And so we get to this place where this, there's this end of this world experience, which is uh, the world could be cosmos, if you would. And so the cosmos includes all the, the carnal systems of this earth. And when those thoughts that they tried, they impregnated us with or interpenetrated our awareness with, literally the truth swallowed those up and the error has no more hold on us whatsoever. We've been freed from that. So this is the cons uh, consummation of this regener regenerative process that we've been talking about for a long time. And everything that's been stored in our divine mind will then come forth because we do have an unction of the Holy One. We do know all things. We really do. And so when all the error thoughts perish, then it releases and there, there's a coming forth of the truth. It becomes visible and it becomes practical to every person. And this is the householder, the householder who brings his things new and, bring, and, and old. And it, what we do is we bring the new in and that old mindset just goes away. We don't battle the old mindset. We don't do, uh, we don't fast, if you would. We don't beg, we please. We just feed on the newness of life and, and this perfection that we've always been and that swallows up the old. So those are just real quick little uh, symbol, uh, symbolisms of some stories that Jesus talked about. And Jesus desired to bring truth uh, to the people that would make them free. That's my greatest desire in my life is to bring truth to people. Everywhere I go, I want to share truth with them. And sometimes it just comes out of me and I can't even hardly control it. And most of the time people are hungry for it. So what do we want to be free from? The many bondages that holds us back. And that's the purpose of speaking these parables. The word parable actually comes from a compound Greek word, P-A-R-A-B-O-L-A, -A, parabola. And it means to throw alongside is what it means. And so in other words, a parable is meant to be a story thrown alongside a more intellectual understanding. And I like that because most of my life, and Donna can tell you in my teaching, I use a lot of stories, a lot of physical pictures. And parables are earthly stories. They illust illustrate heavenly truths. And they're fables. They're, they're not necessarily real, they're, but they are stories, and they help us. And, for example, uh, a, a better illustration given sometimes it means to uh, love one's neighbor that Jesus used was the story of the Samaritan. And he was just showing us how to love our neighbor and how our eternal forgiving father uh, has always forgiven us from the foundation of the world. He forgave us what we needed. And so he uses the story of the prodigal to show the love of God. And that was a fable, but it reveals a spiritual truth. And that was our problem is we didn't look at these uh, parables and our teachers didn't look at them for the spiritual, spiritual truth. They just taught them as true, and because of that, it caused a lot of hardship for people. So the parables, fable stories, exist to reveal, to clarify, and to illustrate truth, if you're taking notes. To reveal, clarify, and to illustrate truth. So the reason they were needed, again, is because people heard Jesus, but they didn't listen intelligently to his sayings, and, and they really wasn't desiring spiritual teaching. They were desiring healing, taxes to be paid, food, miracles, and all kinds of stuff. And they wanted him to kick out the Roman Empire and to be their king. So they missed out on a lot. So the purpose of parables for all of us in our journey of our awareness being raised, if you would, is most often a, a better as a, a physical picture to that to help us to understand the spiritual truth of that. You know, people always say, well, what does raised mean? And of course, they'll think it means a rapture. One of these days, we're all going to be raised up and we're going to fly. And that's where people see that. But the reason these stories and correlations is because they stimulate a higher consciousness. They, they, they trigger the hearer. And if it triggers the hearer, then it causes the hearer to want to learn more. 
And so that's why I like to tell stories sometimes because it'll help people want to know more. It gets them interested. So once our individual awareness rises up to this higher level of spiritual truth, we begin to understand the hints of the living word that come out of those pictures, out of those stories, and our lives are greatly affected. So needing to hear the truth of the living word in stories and parables, uh, if they don't, it hinders a person from listening to the divine word of God. There comes a point where you yourself don't have to hear the story, you begin to tell the story yourself. And that's what I like about the word worship and the word praise. Worship means to ascertain and seek and desire to know a thing, and then the word praise means to tell the story. So sometimes when we go to people, we have to tell a story in a little bit different way. We have to tell it slower and make it to where it makes them want to hear more and more and more, where they can hear the deep inner truth of that. So most often the hearer majors on the physical story more than what the story points to. And Brother Garner used to tell us all the time in the book of Revelation, where it talked about signify, he said it's signs. And he said, when, when somebody points to a sign, you don't go sleep out the sign, you go to the hotel. If you ask me where Holiday Inn is, I'll tell you to go so many miles down the road and turn this way, and you're going to see that great big sign, Holiday Inn. So are you going to the sign, or are you going to what the sign points to, right? And you're going to what the pines is. And so in the Bible, for the most part, we majored on the signs and we never went to what they pointed to. We thought heaven meant a planet to go to somewhere. And we thought heaven had streets that were paved with gold when it just says a street of gold, which is a divine nature. It's an understanding. And the street is a way you walk. So you walk, you tread about your life out of that divine nature. So uh, we know this to be true here because, again, uh, it's, there's, there's, there's this, such this rich man and poor man parable. Most believe, again, that it's real and it's not. So in my 33 years, I was thinking about this last night when I was studying. In my uh, 33 years plus of ministry, my sermons, again, were filled with stories. And I learned that at a very young age and that most people, uh, if they will listen to what they hear, a good story will help them a lot. And again, cause them to desire more. So stories, fables, parables can, by means of being more enlightenment to a person's individual awareness, and then it points them to more and more spiritual understanding. So that's important for us to do. So uh, what do we want to do? Are, are we we want to be able to explain these stories and show how uh, show it in the living word understanding, with the intention of helping the hearer to consciously move toward contact with fathers. The whole thing is to stay in contact. Just like I use example of these lamps. If I buy a lamp and I set it in here and I never connect it, I never make it have contact with the source, what good is it? It's pretty, but it's not going to shine any light. And so we have put on our pretty church clothes and our, you know, and dress the way our religion tells us to. And we try to look like a Christian but we really never realized that we weren't making contact. We had contact. The contact was our divine mind. The contact is that we're one with Father, but we were not able to handle it and function out of it. So we lacked a whole lot of understanding. So anyone who will continue to seek to stay in contact with Father will gain uh, uh, much spiritual insight, and their spiritual ear and spiritual eye will literally uh, acclimate to the quiet and calm voice of the Father. And that's what we really want, is we want to acclimate, we want to get used to hearing that voice of Father. Uh, I think I've said this before, but I have uh, three preachers, actually four preachers, that I really spent a lot of time listening to. One of them was John Corson years ago, that taught more of an outer court, holy place, understanding the Bible. Then Gary Garner, John Cahill, uh, uh, even Lynn Howes, I did a lot of transcribing for him. And then uh, Kay, and those people, I'm attuned to their voice. So when I'm in a crowd, if they're talking, guess who I hear? I hear them. Just like my wife, I'm attuned to Donna's voice. And wherever I go, all she's got to do is say a word and I can be 100 feet from her. And if I could hear her, I know that's my wife. And so that's what we want to do. We want to acclimate to the voice of Father and stay in con with, contact with Father because then there is much spiritual insight there. And our spiritual ear, our spiritual eye opens up. And then... Those thoughts spoken to you are received then. 
The Bible said to receive with meekness the engrafted word of God, which is able to rescue your entire soul. So our soul, our whole being, uh, needs to be rescued from some thing that's hindering us. And the most important thing is for us to become quiet. Because to me, a person that is meek, they're quiet and they're calm. And then they receive, they allow the living word to interpenetrate their conscious awareness and completely change them. So we are products of our ever advancing spiritual consciousness and it's always drawing from the divine mind. So all people who ascertain, seek and desire to know the truth contained in them, they have this capacity, if you would, to hear and to express the truth out of their individual lives. It is our birthright. Uh, we, we are ingrained with this divine nature. I call it the divine nature activity but we do have a divine nature. And what we have to do is we have to allow it to constantly be active. No matter where we're at, what we're doing, we want that divine nature active in us. Somebody asked me today what it means about praying in the name of Jesus. I'm gonna to talk to him later on. But name, one of the meanings of name is nature. And so we function out of the very same nature that Jesus did. And when you pray, quote, in the name of Jesus, you pray according to how Jesus prayed. And we can learn that in John 17. And uh, that's the Lord's Prayer, that whole chapter there. But also, and when we talk about pray, more importantly, we're talking about converse, so we can see how Jesus converse with people, and we can learn to do it that the same way. So the parable number one would be new cloth and old cloth. And that's found in Matthew 9, 16, Mark 2, 21, and Luke 5, 36. Matthew 9, 16, Mark 2, 21, and Luke 5, 36. Jesus invested a great amount of his time amongst the people. That's where he wanted to be, was amongst the people. He would walk through their daily lives. He would walk through Galilee, all different places. And of course, everywhere he went, there were Pharisees and Sadducees and others who would be asking him questions, trying to trip him up. We see that in politics. When Donald Trump was the president, when he was running for president, there was no shortage of people trying to trip him up nonstop. Well, that's what they did to Jesus too, because those people hated Jesus. And then there were some people that were uh, just the people, just general people that wanted to ask him questions. And some of them were rather silly. Uh, they were more for a carnal understanding. And, but he would always answer them with a parable. So one day Jesus was sharing and some of John's disciples came to Jesus and they said, why do we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples do not fast? I mean, what a funny question to ask. Here you are in front of the greatest master comforter teacher that's ever been seen on planet earth. And you got a chance to talk to him. And that's what, why aren't y'all fasting? You know, why? So, so these disciples were asking questions according to their individual awareness. They were more concerned about carnal things and the laws of doing to be. And so they were being driven by that understanding. So they just wanted to ask a question. So in a sense, they were asking, why do your disciples and you struggle do it? And you, why do you not struggle like other people struggle? What's different about you guys? Why do you not fast sensual pleasures all the time? You know, they could have said, why do you not uh, pay taxes? Why do you not pay tithe? They could ask all kinds of stuff like that. And Jesus first said, can the children of the bridegroom mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken from them uh, and, they shall, and then they shall fast. So basically he was saying, no man puts a piece of cloth into an old garment, that which is uh, to fill up and take from the garment and rent, and, and then the rent is made worse. So like if I have a new garment, and I take an old garment that's worn out and I put it with that, then it makes it worse. So he's talking about, then he continues on with this one, uh, the new wine, uh, Matthew 9, 17. He says, neither do men put new wine into old bottles, else the bottles break and the wine runs out and the bottles perish. But they put new wine into new bottles and both are preserved. And so, you know, people look at that and go, what? <laughs> you know, and they have all kinds of explanations of it. So what we see here is when these carnal tools of fasting things become a temptation, that's brought on by old teaching and beliefs. And we can know there's only one type of fast and that type of, that type of fast is fasting 
error thoughts, learning to not dwell on those things. And so what I fast is the old thinking that I have to do something to please God. I fast the error thoughts and I, I refuse to allow those things to dominate my thought realm because I do what Paul said. I cast down those vain imaginations by the truth. I am no longer insecure in my ministry. I used to be years ago. I'm not anymore. I, and anytime something comes in that tries to say, well, the reason you don't have a bunch of people or this or that, I, I cast that down because it matters not whether I'm teaching one person or a thousand people. It's the same thing and the word is coming forth. And so I understand that. So these fasting things that people have thought, they literally give them a sense of separation. They don't understand their oneness with Father. So they think if they can fast enough, they can get God to move. And that's not what Father does. So the Apostle Paul wrote about a present progressive action we all need to be involved in, and that is casting down vain imaginations. And a vain imagination is really a work of the flesh. In other words, it's something I can do to please God or it's something I can do to make myself a better person. And Paul wrote this, and I, this is my translation, but he says, removing, demolishing, and destroying all carnal reasoning in one's imag imagination, thought, brain, and consciousness, and every elevated thought or belief that races up against the awareness of one's union with the Father or hol our holy breath, <clears throat> and bringing into captivity every carnal perception, intellect, and disposition on the lower realm thoughts to the attentive hearkening and compliance and submission to our in-contact mind. And that's 2 Corinthians 10, 5. So let's go through these verses here and kind of see the spiritual application here. Verse 15. <clears throat> when, when our union and our oneness to our divine mind, and we are fully aware of this, then fasting central cravings is not the concern because we know that we have all things that pertain to life and godliness. So I don't have to worry about other things. I don't have to even fast those things anymore because those things are not, they don't have a pull on me anymore. So uh, we, 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 are, we are everything that Father says we are from the foundation of the world, and we have everything that Father says we have. So there comes a point when we know these things that the other things that we used to fast against they're not part of our lives anymore. So in, in verse 16, we see trying to impose this true living word into a re religiously influenced person is usually too much for the old because they're still involved in stale beliefs. So that's putting uh, new wine in an old wineskin. And I have learned that personally myself many years ago because I began to learn a lot of truth that Brother Garner taught that was greater than what we knew before. And I immediately wanted to go to my friends and say, oh, there's no such thing as a, a rapture. There's no such thing as this or whatever. And I was doing a lot of proclaiming, but I wasn't equipped to explain then. So I tried to put this new understanding into those person's old wineskin consciousness, and they rejected it. And to this day, they won't listen to me because I heard them. So it's important for us to realize that we... We, we can't just go take everything we know and bottle it up and put it in somebody that's not ready, right? And so a person constrained by this long time error is not open to hearing truth yet that will make them free. And yes, it's frustrating because we love them and we want to help make them free. We want them to grow with us, but not everybody's ready for that. And then in verse 17, it says, neither, uh, neither uh, the scripture doesn't say this, but basically what he's saying is neither should we pour the truth of the living word tenets into a bottled up religious doctrine because the truth will be rejected as the lie. And we don't want it to happen that way. We don't want people to do that because then when somebody comes along that they will listen to, they won't hear the truth at all because they'll say, oh, I heard that before. Roy Richmond said that a long time ago and I don't want to hear that. So I've written this statement many times. It's not my original, but I believe it. People have believed the lie for so long that when the truth uh, stands in front of them, they reject the, the truth as the lie, and that happens constantly. So it's best to share the truthful word with those who are open, those who are receptive. I always say those who are asking the correct questions, those who are questioning their theology, and they're ready for spiritual growth. So meaning they are really question their theology. And again, when people ask me questions, 
quite often I'll say, why are you asking that question? Because I want to hear them say, I've been looking at this and I've been wondering if this is really what they said it said. And that's when they're beginning to question their theology. So my problem was, is I wasn't apprehended enough back then by what I was learning to give the clear explanation. And I just became a proclaimer. And like Brother Garner says, we need explainers. And very quickly, Father, help me with that. All right, the next is the lamp on a stand, Matthew 5, 14 through 15. Jesus, uh, again, traveled about all through Galilee, and he was teaching in their synagogues, and he was preaching the truthful gospel of the kingdom, trying to explain the best way he could. And again, because the people were so bankrupt in spiritual understanding, he spent a lot of time healing them and ministered to them and providing food and all those things of which they thought they needed, right? They thought they needed it. But the truth is, none of that was permanent. Uh, they became so large in number when they were following him that he went up to a mountaintop. And that's the, where we hear the famous Sermon on the Mount, where he taught. And so he, took a, he went up and his disciples came up with him and sat down and he opened his mouth and he began to speak. And he made 11 statements that started with the phrase, blessed, blessed are. And we know those as the, the uh, Beatitudes, right? Beatitudes means supreme blessedness. And so I like that uh, phrase, blessed are, because it comes from the Greek word, uh, makarios, and it means happy, fortunate, well-off, and even blessed, supremely blessed. And so when you understand these things and you're functioning out your true nature, you're extremely blessed in every area of your life, uh, any area of your life. And again, when you look at the word beatitudes, it means supreme blessedness. Isn't that cool? Mm -hmm. I like that. So in Matthew 5, 14, it says, You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither, verse 15, neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick and giveth light unto all that are in the house. And of course, then we get this song about don't let Satan foof it out. And, you know, it's our responsibility to keep the light burning and don't hide it and all that. So we were always trying to go out and be a, be a light to people, but we didn't have light. We didn't have true light, true understanding. So verse 14, we are the light of the world. And I've taught on that several times. And when we express our true divine nature, that's when everybody will see it. It's one thing just to go out and tell people, I'm light, I'm light. But, you know, telling them is nothing. It's when you express, when you stay in contact with the divine mind, then the literally light, which is energy, begins to flow into the world. And light brings healing. So when we express this, it's important. Uh, verse 15, when we live and move and have our being from that high spiritual consciousness, we cannot hide this intensis, intensity of oneness. I've been, been one with the Father is powerful. Been one with the divine mind is powerful. And being one, it's not just an idea I know that I'm one. I have to be aware that I'm one. I have to experience being one. And, and, and allow that begin to function and flow out of me. So we are holy breath, and we are children of the light. The Bible says that Father is the Father of light. So we are light. We're spiritual energy, and we are made visible, and we are real. You know, this body is not my imagination. It, this The body is real. And then uh, in verse 16, we, we, it literally tells us we have to let our holy breath within to reveal our oneness with Father to ourself, to the point that people can see it, to which we know and we believe, and that becomes our driving force in everything I do. And then I function out on my true nature, who I am. And I turn the light, of, I allow the light of my holy breath, the light of my, if you want to call it spirit, to shine forth to everyone. So contrary to what many people believe, we're not spirits having a human experience. I hear that all the time, that we're spirits having a human experience. We are holy breath experiencing living out of the cool of the day, which is walking in the presence of God moment by moment. And Father is every part of our being. We are sons, we are daughters, and we are in perfect likeness. That's who we are. I am not a human. A human is really, is where they get the word uh, hewn down. We're not hewn down. We're not, we're not fallen people. We're not sinners saved by grace. We're sons and fathers of God. And we always were, and we were born that way. Next is the parable number four, this, of the wise and the foolish builders. 
Matthew 7, 24 through 27. And the King James, it says, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them. So it's very important to hear again and to listen. I will liken him unto a wise man which has built his house upon a rock. Verse 25, And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon the house, and it fell not. For it was founded upon a rock. And every one that heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them, shall be likened unto, and doesn't do them, shall be likened unto a foolish man. Let me fix this here. A foolish man which built his house upon sand. And so here again, to hear is the same thing as obey. Obey means to listen with intelligence. And so if you don't listen with intelligence, you're going to build your house on sand. But it needs to be on this solid rock, if you would, of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Verse 27, the rain descended upon this house that was on the sand, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. And again, people think that's talking about man falling, Adam falling, or whatever. But it was the fall of awareness that took place. So, when we follow this inner prompting to stay in constant contact with Father, to experience being perfect and complete, to revere our union with Father, we are on real spiritual solid ground. And our house is planted in that, and we draw from that. And when we will not be shaken by doubt or fear or impending danger in the face of some kind of uh, unexpected sensory circumstances, and we're, we're, we're not moved that way anymore, then again, we're living out of our, uh, on our solid ground that we have. So this awareness of our abiding connection, is, if you would, is the key or it's the code to life and life more abundantly. Jesus said, and most people say that Jesus came to bring life and life more abundantly, but he, be, he came to bring the awareness that we have life and life more abundantly. So if we do not stand in the truth of who we are, we chase temporal things, we place our faith in temporal things, and we become foolish builders. And we only minister temporal things. And we not in Father's faith, if you would. We want to be in Father's faith of the, uh, of the, of the truthful messenger. We want what comes from many comforter messengers. And that builds the solid foundation that we stand and we don't fall anymore. And I'm, I'm fully aware that people experience healings and what they call miracles, which should be normal. I was talking to Kay about this this week, and we have many times, but it should be just normal to, to something come nigh my dwelling place and it just disappear. It just goes away. It doesn't belong to me. A healing. If we do need a healing, it shouldn't take hours and hours of praying or years and years of praying and fighting and struggling and fasting. It should, it, it, just a living word flowing through us should just drive that out of us. It really should. That's the way it should be. So, uh, yes, I understand. I understand people saying that they believe that Jesus healed them and don't take that away from me or whatever. But the truth is, healing is not permanent because you'll need another healing and another healing and another healing. A miracle, what we call a miracle financial, is not permanent. I've had many times in my life where large amounts of money came into my hands and at that time, I thought it was a miracle, but I spent it. We used it for other things. It's gone, you know. So there's always this need for it if you don't live out of your permanency, which is your spiritual resources. So uh, why is that? Because if the real healing of the disease, the mistaken identity, does not take place, then you're going to continue to have symptom after symptom after symptom that you're going to seek for a miracle for or healing for. And that's why Paul said, and when he was talking about the communion elements, which represent what Jesus came to reveal to us, he said, because people take it in an unworthy manner, not that they're worthy, but the manner they take it, he said, all are sick, all are weak, and all die needlessly. And so if I'm always dependent on Jesus just healing me or giving me a financial miracle, then I'm going to always experience sickness, weakness, and eventually death to the body. So the reason is their teachers of religion have taught them that Jesus is their divine source and not, and, and they don't call on God. And that's something that we need to really deal with here. Uh, 
we, we know that we have all things that pertain to physical life. We know that we have all things that pertain to spiritual life. So can we not make a withdrawal out of both? Can we not make a withdrawal without having somebody to have to pray for us to get it or depending on who we think to be Jesus to come give that to us? I think we can. And I've witnessed people receiving healing and I've witnessed people uh, having some kind of thing that we call miracles. I've had them both myself. However, I believe oftentimes people will tap in, real, literally tap in to the divine source within inside of them. And once they receive what they receive, then they go back on with their regular life. And they're always praising God for what he did for them, not realizing that they tapped in and they drew, made a withdrawal from that very life that's back in them. But then they go right back and they don't continue to live in this supernatural body that we are. And we are supernatural. So one can stay in that place of always needing healing and finances and miracles, but it's much better to live out a life and life more abundantly. It's much better to realize that you have no lack whatsoever in your life. And Jesus came to reveal that. And the Apostle Paul's first set of epistles to the community of believers at Corinth, he wrote, you feed on the truthful word given you haphazardly, like you're having a party you do not discern who you really are. And of course, the Catholic translators put in there, you don't discern the Lord's body, but they added the word Lord's. In other words, you don't discern your body. You don't dissect. You don't know who you are. And so you, you kind of haphazardly take these words of truth and you don't receive them with meekness. You just kind of wish that they were going to take place. So the wise and foolish builder is a physical picture of this variance of perspectives. There's a wise builder that has one perspective and the other one that has another perspective. One question we must ask ourselves is, why learn about the living word and these truth principles if we do not apply them to ourselves? We must apply these things to ourselves. I always use the example of getting on an airplane and they start talking about the oxygen mass and they say if we lose our pressure, the oxygen mass will drop down and they say put yours on before you help somebody else. Too many times we want to help other people before we put it, applying it to ourselves. And we must apply it to ourselves. So this parable is a comparison of someone who has the right thoughts, the right choices, and the right actions, and those who do not. And that's what it is. The first perspective is based on an individual, individual consciousness, which would be the house, which becomes spiritual sound, which would be digging in the living word. And it's founded on truth principles, which is the solid rock. So when external circumstances produces initial, uh, emotional disturbances, which could be the flood arising, the tide of temporal appearances may be seen intimidating. But when you've written, when you built your house on, on sol the solid rock, on the living word, then those rivers bursting against the house don't affect you whatsoever. Because in this world, in this cosmos system, there are tests. And the test is, have you, have you built your house on solid ground? And if you built your house on solid ground, then what's going on out in this world is not going to affect you whatsoever. So an individual conscious built in the living word will not be shaken by, if you would, temporal uh, nature of outer appearances. And we realize that they are no thing whatsoever. On the other hand, those who learn about the truth of the living word and they fail to apply it depend on the individual consciousness rather than the spiritual consciousness. They literally bow down to carnal material, such as uh, a carnal focused consciousness, which is the house without a foundation. Uh, they think they do not have enough. Uh, they don't believe that they're, they don't have any understanding about really being in contact with the divine mind. And they're always seeking uh, uh, to, to create a better relationship with Father. You know, those songs we sing, Draw Me Nearer, and all those things. We, we don't realize that we're as near as we can ever be. And what happens, that, that, that uh, prevents, when, when you draw on the truth, and you realize you're on this foundation, then that pre present, uh, prevents unnecessary weakness, it prevents unnecessary sickness, and it prevents living as dead. Because the most important thing to know about dead is as separate from Father God, not knowing God. And, of course, that will affect the physical body, too. So, you know, those are just some beginnings of some of the parables. We're going to go through all 46 
Uh, next week, I'm going to start with a money lender, and then we'll go through probably three or four more of those. And I, I, I hope you're going to like them. Uh, I, Donna said, well, you're going to you're going to do that many at one time. Well, they're not something that you would preach a whole a whole two or three chapters on. Each one of them has their own individual truths. But the important thing to understand is it's always about an awareness. And so Father, Father from the very beginning has always tried to raise man's awareness. When, when the first race of man began to feed on the knowledge of good and evil and they falsely identified with it, Father uh, didn't chase them out of the garden. He chased them constantly trying to clothe them and clothing always means to bring their awareness up higher. He sent messengers to him. He sent prophets to him. He sent writers to him, and they kept rejecting. He sent Jesus to him, and they were so bankrupt they still wouldn't hear. And then he equipped Paul and John and many other messengers. And I believe there's been every generation there have been a people who have embraced truth. But I'm praying that this generation that we're in and I believe that the masses are beginning to do that. And it's important for us to stay focused, not get led astray by every wind of doctrine, because even when you get in what you call the grace message, the finished work message, or the kingdom message, or whatever, every one of them has some kind of wind of doctrine, and we want to stay away from doctrine. If there's any doctrine, I want the doctrine that Jesus taught. So I hope you enjoyed that, and I hope it blessed you. It'll be here for you to watch uh, later on after I'm done. I'll just share it. It'll be on the Facebook page. And later tonight, I'll have it uploaded to YouTube. And that my account is Dr. Roy, middle initial E, Richmond on YouTube. And you can watch all my videos on there. And of course, we have books available for you. You can go to DrRoyErichmond.com. So we love you guys. I know this was a little, I guess it was almost an hour, so it's okay. But uh, I hope you enjoy it as we get going through there. I think this is really going to bring us a lot of understanding of these parables that are going to help our lives and also to equip you to help other people because people are asking questions. Almost everyone that writes me says their friends, their family, people they work with, they're, they're quoting the King James Version, and I need to know how to explain it to them. So that's what we're doing, and hopefully the first two books, you got them, and they'll help you. This one will here, and we'll just continue on. And my whole journey from here on out, I believe, is going to be teaching the spiritual code and symbology of the living word and go all through the word. So we love you. Sharon, thanks for being here. Carol, good to see you here. We love you guys. Have a great Sunday. Bye-bye.